from Florence, Italy. The city of inspiration for sculptors in ages past and for centuries to come. You're listening to The Sculptor's Funeral. Good day to you all and welcome to The Sculptor's Funeral, the podcast for sculptors working in the figurative tradition and those who love them. I am your host, Jason Arkels, a sculptor and art historian living and working in Florence, Italy, where all the great sculptors are dead, and I don't feel so well myself. And today, we continue our exploration into the sculpture and sculptors of ancient Greece, with this episode picking up immediately after the end of the life of the great sculptor Polycletus. Now, What we're going to cover today spans more than half of the 4th century BC, that is, from about the year 400 to about 340 BC. And although this specific period in Greek history doesn't have an easy-to-remember name like the Classical Period or the Hellenistic Period, I guess it's technically late classical, but anyway, this time, from 400 to 340 or so, It's a time when the legacies of the great sculptors of the previous generation come into their own, and thanks to the precedents set by Phidias and Myron and Polycletus, we see a blossoming of sculpture all over Greece. New genres are invented, new subjects are tackled, and most notably, there are a lot of really good sculptors around. In fact, this period is so fruitful with art and artists that I'm going to make this a two-part episode. And that's actually one of the reasons it's uh, taken me so long to get this particular episode out. There's, there's just so much to cover. And so to get started, we need to refresh our memories as to the politics and culture of 5th century BC Athens and learn what comes next for the world's first democratic nation. Now, the last several episodes have detailed the triumphs of Athens over its military and political rivals, the formation of an Athenian empire known as the Delian League, which dominated trade and culture in the Mediterranean. We talked about the rise of Pericles, the populist ruler of Athens, whose immortality was secured by his almost unbelievable building schemes on the Acropolis, including the Parthenon and several colossal sculptures, which likewise strain credulity for their scale cost, and quality. The golden age of Pericles saw the fostering of philosophy, science, literature, and the arts of painting and sculpture. The building programs of Athens inspired its satellite city-states within the Delian League to follow suit with their own temple building projects, which of course needed sculpture to adorn them. Several sculptors rose to prominence, which directly inspired schools of followers for the next several generations, and only slightly less directly inspired artists around the world for the next 2,000 years. This was classical Athens. And so, from this point onward, classical Greece lived happily ever after, dwelling in a Shangri-La of culture and learning and benevolent rule by enlightened leaders. Well, I'm joking, of course. It didn't go that way at all. After all, the word classic does literally translate to the word best. So what comes after the best period in Greece's history inevitably isn't going to be as good. But from the time from around 432 BC to almost the end of the 5th century, it wasn't just a decline or a a sunsetting of the good times for Athens. It was a a 27-year period of blundering catastrophes of foreign and domestic policy that reduced Athens from a mighty empire to almost complete ruin and foreign subjugation. Now, what was the cause of this devastation? Well, to put it in simplest terms, it was Sparta. The warlike city-state of Sparta was technically allied with Athens after the defeat of the Persian Empire in 480 BC, but throughout the next several decades, tensions flared between these two powers. Now, you might think that Athens and Sparta could live peacefully side by side as allies with shared interests as fellow Greeks, but also with distinct interests that had little overlap. Now, Athens controlled the mainland of Greece as well as the sea and had numerous allies in the Delian League. Meanwhile, Sparta controlled the Peloponnesian Peninsula and had a league of its own, the Peloponnesian League. Sparta wasn't expansionist like Athens was and had little interest in seafaring. Its military might was limited to land battles at which it excelled as much as Athens excelled by fighting at sea. Now, when these two neighbors worked together, as they did against the Persians, 
their different strengths united into an unstoppable force. Now, it would seem an alliance or even a unification into a single unified Greek state would secure their dominance in the region forever. But what was stopping that was culture. Athens was a democracy, and Sparta was an oligarchy, a small group of ruling families under the authority of a king. And Sparta was at least as proud of its political structure as Athens was of its democracy. So unification was never really on the table, and the two powers agreed, at least in theory, to remain allies, but this inevitably broke down as the impulse for expansionism in Athens, met with distrust and fear on the part of the Spartans of a too powerful Athens, led to conflict after conflict. I won't go into all the intrigues and twists of these conflicts, as there are many, and they were over a long period of time, but I'll hit the highlights and their ramifications that are relevant to understanding Greek sculpture. So in the period between 465 and 459, about the time Pericles was just coming into power, Sparta had some political troubles in the form of a slave revolt and also some internal squabbling among members of the Peloponnesian League. Now, it was none of Athens' business, but Athens couldn't resist in sticking their nose into these conflicts in order to gain at Sparta's expense by forming alliances with rebel factions within the Peloponnesian League. Now, the Spartans would have none of that, and the two engaged in intermittent fighting in various locations for the next 15 years. They made peace in 445. Now, this 15-year period of fighting was not too unusual in terms of relations between Greek city-states. And at the time, the war was overshadowed by all the good things happening in Athens, from the development of Greek theater to the development of the buildings on the Acropolis. Yet today, we, we know this protracted conflict as the First Peloponnesian War. And when a war has a name containing the word first in it, you know what's coming. And it came in the year 431 BC, just as work on the Parthenon was finishing up. Again, no need to go into details, as the root causes of the conflict remain the same, Spartan distrust and Athenian overreach. The effects of the Second Peloponnesian War, however, were crucially significant to the fate of Athens. So on one side, you got the Spartans and their unbeatable ground army, and the Athenians with their indomitable navy. So how did these two powers fight each other? The simple answer is that they didn't, because they couldn't. It was kind of a weird war at first. The Spartans would invade Attica, you know, the mainland of Greece, and effortlessly occupy cities and countryside, while the locals fled for protection behind the walls around Athens, uh, which, if you remember, also include the Long Walls, a fortified corridor running from Athens down to the seaport of Athens at Piraeus. The Long Walls soon developed into a shanty town housing refugees fleeing from Spartan forces from all over Athenian territory. The invading Spartans, for their part, didn't have the manpower to effectively occupy all the territory that they had taken, and, being sticklers to their own traditions, the Spartan soldiers had the right to rotate out of the armed conflict after three weeks to go home and tend to their farms or participate in religious festivals. During these decades of conflict, the Spartan army's longest unbroken period of Attic occupation was a mere 40 days. Meanwhile, all the Athenian navy could do was launch raids on the coastal towns of the Peloponnese, and like the Spartans, were incapable of holding territory for long, if at all. It was a pretty ineffectual war on both sides, but there was soon a disastrous consequence to the Athenian strategy of duck and cover behind the long walls. Soon, that cramped shantytown between the long walls was riddled with disease of the worst sort, bubonic plague. It probably arrived on a trading ship at the port, spread through the shantytown and into Athens proper, killing somewhere between one and two-thirds of its population. In the year 429, Pericles himself, along with his sons, died of plague. The city-state of Athens never fully recovered from the disastrous plague and the economic effects of ongoing war from this time, and in 429 BC, the Peloponnesian War was far from over. Skirmishes and battles were waged, pieces and truces brokered and then broken. But the final misstep in Athenian mismanagement came in 415, when Athens got word that one of their allied city-states on the island of Sicily was under attack by Syracuse, a town also in Sicily, but allied with Sparta. Athens sent ships and troops in order to not only repel that attack, but to conquer all of Sicily. And they failed. 
utterly. With the help of Sparta, Syracuse vanquished the Athenian fleet, causing the Athenians to flee inland on foot, where they were either mowed down or enslaved. By 413, Athens barely had any navy left, a depleted treasury, as well as a depleted male populace of fighting age. The Spartans now had a clear advantage, and they made the most of it, but they still couldn't seal the deal and destroy Athens outright, and a string of Athenian victories against the Spartans meant the war dragged on for another decade, until the inspired Spartan commander, Lysander, gained occupation of the last remaining source of Athens' grain supply and destroyed the last of the Athenian navy. The starving, poverty-stricken, and diseased Athens surrendered to Sparta in 404 BC. Athens was forced to destroy its city walls and fortifications, including the Long Walls. The Delian League was dissolved. Athens was subsumed into the Spartan Empire, where the once mighty power lost its independence forever. Now, despite all this disaster, it was far from the end of Athens. Over the next few decades, as part of the Spartan Empire, Athens recovered and grew strong and prosperous once again, although nothing like in its former days of empire. In the year 371, after three decades under Spartan rule, Sparta itself was defeated by the rising city-state of Thebes, which meant that Athens, too, was put under Theban control. Athens had become, once again, just one more Greek city-state among many. Despite all this, the production of Greek sculpture continued. The career of Polycletus, covered in the last episode, coincides with the Peloponnesian Wars, and with the end of the wars and the end of Polycletus, right around the year 400 BC, we turn a page in the history of sculpture of ancient Greece. So, what happened next? Well, not much, at least not in the short term. Uh, plague and war have a way of slowing sculptural production down. I just look at the artistic production in Florence in the decades following the Black Death in 1349, and you'll see just that. Not only did the war and plague destroy a generation of potential sculptors in Athens and elsewhere, it destroyed a generation of sculpture as well. Athens was forced to melt down many of their gold and bronze statues from the temples on the Acropolis to pay for the war effort. Now, there are many sculptors whose names we know from this time, but whose work we will never see. Despite this, the influence of the great classical sculptors, Myron, Phidias, and Polycletus, carried on. Not just in Argos, but in places like Olympia, on the islands of Samos and Paros, and even in Athens amidst all its turmoil. The assistants and students and disciples of these sculptors became the first generation of schools, each building on the aesthetic or technique or just the reputation of their guiding master from the classical past. Now we'll take a look at what survives from this tumultuous period when the sculptor's funeral continues. Hey everybody, Oh, how did it get to be January already? I hope you're doing well. Uh, I am doing very well indeed, thanks for asking. I am knee deep in work in my studio in Florence, which is always good and I am preparing my summer tour schedule as well. And seeing as how last year took me out of the studio for a full six months and nearly killed me, I'm scaling back a bit this year, just doing four months this time around, uh, but you should be able to find me in all my usual places, the US, the UK, Australia. And you can check out my tour schedule at thesculptorsfuneral.com by clicking on the workshops link to find out when and where and how to sign up for a course. And it's cool. This year, I'm, uh, I'm offering a new course that I'm pretty excited about. I'm calling it the Sculpture Clinic. Now, the Sculpture Clinic is sort of an evolution of a uh, composition sketch course I've been offering for a while now. So for the Sculpture Clinic, participants come to the workshop with a theme or a narrative or otherwise an idea for a sculpture or a monument or a memorial. And over the course of several days, each student develops the idea into a scale model learning the elements of composition, drapery and bases, pedestals, objects, environments, the mechanics of narrative structure and sculpture, everything needed to take an idea and make a sculpture out of it. We'll be using multiple models of both sexes who will take turns posing for each participant, and participants can model their work in the material of their choice, whether it's uh, oil clay, water clay, wax, whatever you prefer. It's a course designed for more experienced sculptors, and along with the instruction and lectures given by me, 
we will be talking about our ideas to the other participants in roundtable discussions so that everyone gets feedback and constructive criticism from our peers. Now, like I said, I'm really excited to be offering this. I, I really don't think there's anything out there like this. Um, and I'm even thinking if this goes well this year, this summer, I'm thinking about uh, hosting the same sort of workshop once or twice a year in my studio in Florence. Uh, we'll, we'll see. So far, I've booked the Sculpture Clinic in Brisbane, Australia, and San Jose, California, and we're going to see if we can find another venue as well this summer. In any event, I hope to see you at one of my workshops one of these days. So, I mentioned that sculpture production in and for Athens continued during the Peloponnesian War, and I've covered many of the highlights already in the discussion of Polycletus from the last episode. But there are a few additional pieces made in Athens in the late 5th century that I'd like to mention. One of them is the portrait bust of Pericles, ruler of classical Athens. It was made soon after his death in around 425 BC by the sculptor Cresilus. Now, you might remember the name Cresilus from the last episode. He was one of the five sculptors chosen to make a wounded Amazon statue for the Temple of Artemis in Ephesus, to be placed alongside similar sculptures made by Phidias and Polycletus and a few others. Well, Cresilus is most remembered today for his bust of Pericles, wearing a Corinthian helmet, which was copied innumerable times in antiquity. The original in bronze is now, of course, lost. You might actually be familiar with this bust. Uh, plaster casts of one of the marble versions are commercially available, and I know of at least two ateliers that have it in their cast collections. And one can easily imagine the reason for the enduring popularity of this bust. It sort of serves as an icon of the good times of classical Athens, guided by the genius of Pericles. The sculptor Cresilus is said to have been associated with the school of Myron in Argos, although he actually studied under a sculptor named Dorotheus. Still, history sort of lumps Cresilus into the school of Myron. And um, about these schools, listen, when, when we think about these schools, it's probably more accurate to think of them as associations or groups of disciples, rather than being strictly a matter of lineage from master to pupil although that, of course, did occur. But in the instance of Cresilus, it was a matter of influence rather than a strict master-pupil thing between himself and Myron. Cresilus seems to have had an interest in portraiture and in producing naturalistic work like athletes and warriors rather than more idealized sculpture like gods. So it's no surprise that he associated himself with the school of Myron, the sculptor of the idiosyncratic and naturalistic discus thrower. Myron is considered sort of the, the least, quote, classical of the classical sculptors due to his interest in naturalism and his secondary interest in idealization. Now, today we use the words idealize and classicize to mean more or less the same thing. But of course, in the classical period, not all sculptors idealized or otherwise worked up figures based on canons or aesthetics of an ideal. And Myron is considered to be in the naturalistic camp. Now, I would imagine that if portraiture was your thing back then, you would naturally gravitate to the school of Myron. Myron himself, though, had only one direct pupil, apparently, his own son, Lycios, though none of his works survive. So, if naturalism was the hallmark of the school of Myron, what were the general characteristics of the schools of the other two classical greats, Phidias and Polycletus? Who were their followers, and what did they achieve? Well, the school of Phidias can be characterized by a high moral tone, a seriousness, and a heroicism in the representation of figures, which were usually gods or allegorical characters. So if you were a sculptor attracted to, say, official state commissions, or, or you wanted to create effigies and sculptures for temples, you might ally yourself with the school of Phidias. The sculptor Alcamenes was probably more of a chief assistant to Phidias than a pupil. And when Phidias died in around 430 BC, Alcamenes became known as the number one sculptor in Athens. Now, sadly, we have no positive identification of any specific sculpture tied to Alcamenes, though it is generally considered that the talents and style of Alcamenes must be amply represented in the Parthenon frieze or in the pediments of the Parthenon. Additionally, Alcamenes has been put forward as the most probable sculptor 
of a very famous group of statues on the Acropolis, the group today known as the Caryatids. Now, a Caryatid, as many of you know, is a figurative sculpture which acts as an architectural column. Actually, that's true only if it's a female figure. Female figures are Caryatids. If it's a male, it's known as an atlas or as a telamon. And at the temple on the Acropolis known as the Erechtheion, we find the famous group of female figures supporting a porch roof, which gives the entire genre its name. Okay, so this temple, the Erechtheion, it's, uh, it's a temple dedicated to the legendary Athenian king, Erechtheus, as well as to several gods, including Athena, Poseidon, and Artemis. And the Erechtheion was central to Athenian worship. The temple itself really is a complex of small sacred sites and buildings grouped together. And among other architectural features, we find the famous porch projecting from the side of the temple. And it's one of three porches on the Erechtheion, in fact. Now, the temple design it seems sort of a hodgepodge, and this is in part because the original design by Phidias himself was shrunk down due to budget cuts necessitated by war. Anyway, this one particular porch is known as the Porch of the Maidens because supporting the roof of the porch are six female figures serving as columns. In other words, caryatids. But not just any caryatids. The caryatids because these six statues represent maidens from the Greek city of Carrie. Now, at Carrie, there was a temple dedicated to Artemis, and a famous ritual at that temple involved maidens, real ones, dancing ecstatically, each supporting a basket of reeds on their heads. Now, we can presume that the image of worshippers of the goddess Artemis dancing with baskets on their heads at the city of Carrie was a well-known image in Athens and throughout Attica. Because these stone figures supporting the roof of the porch, with their heads topped with column capitals made to look like reed baskets, were immediately and forever associated with the little town of Carrier, and therefore called Caryatids. So, although we don't really know if Alchemenes made the Caryatids, they certainly are recognized as representative of the school of Phidias, with their monumentality, their somber grace, and their style of drapery which today is commonly called the wet look. It's sort of a clingy drapery, which reveals the nude form underneath as much as it conceals. Wet drapery is a hallmark of Phidian style. We see it in a surviving work by another of Phidias's pupils, Pionios. In the last phase of Phidias's life, when he was working on the colossal statue of Zeus for the Temple of Zeus at Olympia, he had a pupil by the name of Pionios. And Pionios was given the commission of the Acrotyrian, of the Temple of Zeus. Now, a lot of new words in this episode today. An acrotyrion is a statue or decorative motif placed at the roof of a temple, right? Either at the corners or at the apex of the roof. Now, in church architecture or even in furniture design, such an object is often called a finial. But when it's on a Greek temple, it's, it's an acrotyrion. Anyway, the Temple of Zeus needed an allegory of victory, which is known as Nike, to serve as its acrotarian, and Pionios made it. Substantial fragments of this particular Nike survive and are in the Museum of Olympia. And, of course, you can see this statue also at the image gallery of the Sculptor's Funeral. Just go to thesculptorsfuneral.com and click on the image gallery link, scroll to the bottom of the page, and click on episode 81. And there you will find the Nike of Pionios, and you'll find the Porch of the Maidens and the other sculpture mentioned in this episode. And when you do take a look at these sculptures, take a look at the drapery of the Nike and of the Caryatids, and note the sheer, sort of wet look of the drapery. This wet look is kind of a new look for drapery, and it's in contrast, at least, to the heavier, more symmetrical treatment of drapery we find in archaic or severe styles of sculpture. It's the same sort of wet look that we find in the pediment sculptures of the Parthenon. And as I mentioned, it's a hallmark of the school of Phidias. Phidias didn't invent it, though. We can, we can find examples of attempts at the wet look all the way back to the Archaic period. But it seems to typify the Phidian school at this point in history. Although later, during the Hellenistic era, we find wet drapery everywhere. So in addition to Alchemenes and Pionios, we find in the first generation of the school of Phidias a sculptor named Agorakritos, uh, he was a sculptor of a sort of 
anti-Venus known as Nemesis, which unfortunately is now lost. Uh, there's another sculptor named Callimachus, who apparently originated the Corinthian capital in architecture, and uh, several others in the School of Phidias, whose work, again, does not survive or cannot be positively identified. So finally, let's turn to the school of Polycletus and see where the adherents of his school take his ideas of commensurability and canon. Now, the legacy and influence of Polycletus far outstrips those of Phidias and Myron in the 4th century BC, and it's easy to understand why. Polycletus wrote a book. In his famous lost treatise on sculpture called The Canon, Polycletus did what no sculptor had done before him and what too few sculptors have done after. He thoroughly described his working method as well as the aesthetic principles which guide his method, and he published it for the world to see and understand. Now, with a copy of the canon under their arm, young sculptors who wished to emulate Polycletus could do so much more easily than those who wished to emulate Phidias. And for the beginner sculpture student, it was the only textbook around, so even if you had no particular leaning towards the work of Polycletus, you were still more familiar with his method and aesthetic than you were with any other old master. Not only that, Polycletus did teach, and he had assistants and pupils who continued his ideas after his death in around 410 BC. In the episode which focused on Polycletus, I mentioned his direct pupil, Nalchides, whose work I used as an example of Polycletus' ideas and principles in sculpture. Nalchides was one of several direct pupils of Polycletus that we know of, and then after his direct pupils, we have pupils of pupils, as well as indirect students and followers and imitators spanning several generations. Dozens of names and scores or even hundreds of statues from this period which owe a debt to the legacy of Polycletus. But as is too often the case in Greek art, matching the name of a sculptor to an existing statue is a rarity. We have names of sculptors like Erisandros, Tisander, Canacus, Euphronor, Pison, and Athenodorus. And we have sculptures known as the Getty Bronze, the Dresden Youth, the Berlin Hermes, the Richelieu Hermes, the Barberini Hermes, and the Antikythera Perseus. But who sculpted what? Educated guesses are still simply guesses. But then there come the individuals whose works and names rise to the top of the list of 4th century Greek sculpture. And of the followers of Polycletus, two names stand out, Lysippus and Scopus. Now, both were born in the 390s BC and therefore did not study under Polycletus directly, who died 20 years before. But both carried on the aesthetics and traditions of Polycletian sculpture. However, as all notable artists do, Lysippus and Scopus expanded on the foundation of their learning to produce more than just an homage to their master. In fact, the work they created can be seen as the beginning of a transition from the classic forms of the 5th century into a period of Greek sculpture we now call Hellenism. Now, the term Hellenism comes from the word that the Greeks used to describe their own land, Hellas. So, Hellenism implies a broader focus than, say, just the sculpture of classical Athens or the culture of Sparta or the rule of one city over another. During the 4th century, after Athens was conquered by Sparta and Sparta in turn conquered by Thebes, these separate city-states, whether in war or in peace with each other, started to have more in common with each other than they ever had before. Now, this was largely fueled by trade and by continued economic expansion into the Mediterranean. The notion that the various peoples of Greece were more Greek than, say, Athenian or Corinthian was solidified in the year 336 B.C., when all of Greece was conquered and united by a certain Macedonian king now known as Alexander the Great. The Hellenistic era begins there, in 336, and would endure for a few centuries until the rise of the Roman Empire. But we're getting ahead of ourselves there. Um, in the second part of this two-part episode, I'll go into detail concerning the rise of Alexander the Great and the continued flourishing of the sculpture of Greece. But we've still got a few things to cover in the sort of post-classical, pre-Hellenistic 4th century. Let's turn back to Lysippus and Scopus, the heirs to the teachings of Polycletus. Uh, well, actually, no. <laughs> I'm going to leave Lysippus until the second part of this episode because he became the favorite sculptor of Alexander the Great. So we'll talk about Lysippus later 
even though he is an exact contemporary of Scopus. So, Scopus. Scopus was from the Greek island of Paros, where some of the best Greek marble comes from. And in fact, Scopus preferred marble to bronze for his sculpture, which absolutely was a departure from the previous generation's preferences for bronze. Now, in his lifetime, Scopus was famous as being a sculptor of gods. And today, he is known to have made dozens of works, the majority of them in marble. Only a few works which survive today in copies can be attributed to him, such as the, such as the popular bust of the mythical hero Meleager, of which we have many copies, or his head of the goddess Hygieia. Now, in these two heads, we can clearly see the influence of Polycletus with their sunken eyes and squared-off faces. But then, in other works attributed to Scopus, we see a departure, not just in material or in proportions, but in, in mood. Now, where Phidias and Polycletus sought harmony and balance and calm simplicity and noble grandeur and all that, much of what we find in Scopus is about passion and energy. And where Polycletus sought economy of means, Scopus prefers to be elaborate. Now, just listen to the description by Pliny the Elder of one of Scopus's major works. Most highly esteemed are those works in the shrine of Domitius in the Circus Flaminius. Neptune himself, Thetis, Achilles, Nereids seated on dolphins, sea dragons or sea horses, tritons, a chorus of forces, swordfish, and many other sea creatures, all carved by the same hand. A magnificent achievement, even if it had taken his whole life. Now, what Pliny is describing here is an entire tableau of marble sculptures, of mythological beasts and gods that, well, it seems to describe something we might see in the High Baroque period, rather than in Classical Greece. Now, it might be a stretch to call Scopus the Bernini of ancient Greece, but his work was likely driven by the same cycle that we see repeated over and over in the history of figurative sculpture. A period of high classicism and intellectual restraint, followed by a period of passion and exuberance, like the Baroque after the Renaissance. And then the cycle continues, back to the restraint of passion in favor of intellect, like neoclassicism after the Rococo. Now, very little, if any, of Scopus's Neptune shrine still exists, so we're going to have to turn to a few other works of his to glimpse the exuberance and passion of Scopus. So if you can, go to thesculptorsfuneral.com, check out the image of the work of Scopus there, you'll find, known as Pothos. Now, Pothos is a mythological figure associated with Aphrodite, the goddess of love. And Pothos is the god of desire, yearning, and longing. And in the image, we see Pothos standing, but with his feet crossed at the ankles and then leaning quite heavily to one side, as if there is a sort of a missing element to the sculpture that he should be leaning on. Historians think that he once could have been leaning on a figure of Aphrodite, but for some reason, all the existing copies of the original, and there are several, show the solitary Pothos. In some copies, uh, he's supported by drapery, or he's leaning on a pedestal, or even playing a lyre, like the copy found in Rome at the Capitoline Museum. But in all versions, we see that Scopus gives us something new, in subject matter and in treatment. Gone is the balance and symmetry of Contraposto and Chiasmus, for which the theories of Polycletus were famous. This figure is positively unbalanced. Despite the harmony of the classical idealized anatomy and the symmetrical features of the face, which, of course, owe everything to Polycletus, the pose of Pothos is practically a refutation of the ideas of Polycletus. And then there's the subject itself, Pothos, the mythical demigod of desire. Now, up to now, most of the output we've seen in Greek sculpture concerns itself with gods in their majesty, warriors and athletes in their ideal forms, heroes and rulers imbued with somber strength, the celebration of great men and great athletes and great nations and great gods who did great things. The adjectives applied to classical Greek sculpture are always ones like balance, harmony, proportion, strength, restraint, control. But with the pothos, we have the opposite of balance, physically and psychically. Desire is the opposite of control and balance. It literally is the state of wanting, of need. 
This really isn't a statue of a demigod so much as it's a statue of a human emotion. And today, of course, we consider the expression of passion and emotion one of the basic functions of art. But it's not until Scopus that we find a sculptor exploring these themes in full-scale sculpture in the round. Even when a figure like Dionysus, the god associated with wine and sex, even when he's been depicted in sculpture previous to this, we find him rendered with the same calm simplicity and noble grandeur as we find in an Apollo. We do find representations of the effects of passion on things like vases and, and drinking cups well before the time of Scopus, but for this sort of theme to be rendered in marble on a life scale, it just takes more commitment to the theme than we have yet encountered. Now, it proved to be immediately popular, and the presentation of human emotions and passions as the basis for artistic creation became a staple of Hellenism and almost every art movement since. Now, looking at the pothos, you may agree that while it's quite different from the balanced formulas of Polyclitus, it's hardly a display of unbridled desire, as I might be making it sound. After all, the figure is only just sort of leaning over and has his feet crossed. Well, Scopus was only warming up with the pothos. In around 360 BC, Scopus made a figure of a dancing minad. Now, a minad was a female devotee of the god Dionysus, who would dance in frenzied trances as part of the ritual worship of Dionysus. You might be more familiar with the Roman name of Dionysus, which is Bacchus, and his female followers known as Bacchants, right? So a minad is just the same thing as a Bacchant. It's just the Greek word rather than the Latin. And it's with the minad that Scopus secures himself a place in the history books as a sculptor of passion. There is a probable fragmented copy of this work known as the Dresden Minad, and I've got an image of that as well over at the website, um, but I'm going to read a description of Scopus's Minad that was written by a Greek writer named Callimachus, uh, just to give you an idea of the impact that uh, Scopus's Minad had. The statue of a Minad, wrought from Parian marble, has been transformed into a real Minad. For the stone, while retaining its own nature, yet seemed to depart from the law which governs stone. What one saw was really an image, but art carried imitation over into actual reality. You would have seen that, hard as it was, it became soft to resemble the feminine, though its vigor corrected the femininity, and that, though it lacked the power to move, it knew how to dance in Bacchic frenzy, responding to the god as he entered within. When we saw her face, we stood speechless. So clear upon it was the evidence of sense perception, though perception was not present. So clear was the intimation of Bacchic divine possession stirring Bacchic frenzy, though no such possession aroused it. And as many signs of passion that a soul goaded by divine madness displays, these blazed out from it, fashioned by art in fashion indescribable. So the new direction Scopus pursues by portraying heightened emotion in his works lays the groundwork for one of the many paths Hellenistic sculpture would pursue, but he certainly wasn't the only sculptor in his day drawing from new sources of inspiration. There was another sculptor, exactly contemporary with Scopus and with Lysippus, who was coming up with new subjects and new styles of his own and who would have an impact on Hellenistic sculpture that at least equals the contributions of Scopus. And that sculptor was named Praxiteles. And we'll get to Praxiteles and to Lysippus in the part two of this episode. So stay tuned. Well, thanks for listening. Now, don't forget, you can check out additional content at the Sculptor's Funeral website, thesculptorsfuneral.com, or on our YouTube channel or on our Facebook group page. You can also subscribe to the podcast, oh, everywhere, Apple Podcasts, you know, the dozens of podcast apps out there. And you can receive the podcast automatically on your PC, tablet, or mobile device as soon as new episodes air. Now, if you want to help the podcast reach other people, go ahead and leave a review or give the podcast a rating wherever you subscribe. Also, as always, at the sculptorsfuneral.com website, you can stream the complete archives of the show. You can check out the image galleries for this and all the other episodes. 
And you can support the podcast by buying some Sculptures Funeral merchandise or by making a donation. And finally, click on the sponsor of the podcast, Blick Art Supplies, at thesculpturesfuneral.com. By clicking on that link and buying from Blick, it helps to support the podcast. And for that, I thank you. Thanks again for listening, and have a productive week.